Hello, Facebook. I'm William Bennett, Conservation Specialist with the Smithsonian Institution Archives. And we're here today with you live on social media to share uh, the answer to an archival mystery in our collections. You might remember from those who follow us on social media this beautiful bison image that we shared with you last year when we completed a conservation treatment. As you can see, it's on a large scale. And originally, this was a photographic image that was then hand colored over the top of that to create a warm and more realistic looking image. When we got it, it was on a deteriorating wooden stretcher that was causing all sorts of problems to the linen backing underneath the paper drawing. So we removed that. You can see these nail holes from the original method of attachment to the frame. And then we carefully repaired with an acrylic adhesive any broken or missing areas from behind. And then use that same acrylic adhesive with these strips of paper to attach it to a backing board. And you can read more about that on our blog, the links to which will be live in the video later on. But uh, as is sometimes the case in museum, archival, and library collections, it wasn't clear who originally made these images, where they came from, what their purpose was, or even how they were made. And while some of those answers are still uh, in the wind, as it were, we do have uh, some new uncovered information that sheds some light on why these bison enlargements were originally made. So we're going to share a little sneak peek into that with you. Not long ago, in December of last year, one of our institutional history fellows gave a lecture to SIA staff, to the archive staff, about um, Mr. William Temple Hornaday. He was the founder of the Smithsonian's National Zoological Park, the National Zoo, and he was a particular champion of the conservation of the American bison. At the 1888 Cincinnati Centennial Exposition of the Ohio Valley and Central States, he put on an exhibition about the extermination or the extinction of the American bison. And for that, he made several, he brought several taxidermied uh, bison, he brought skulls and other skeletal remains, and he created a series of other didactics, including images. Now, our institutional history fellow showed us a slide from this exposition uh, in the lecture. And as soon as she did, a detail of it caught my eye. That which is marked out in a red box in this print we've got here. You can see, possibly, that there are four framed images there. And as soon as I saw them, I thought, those look remarkably similar to the bison drawings that we have got currently in our conservation lab. So uh, with some help from our photo archivist and our senior conservator, we got a more uh, a higher quality version of that image and enhanced several portions of it, trying to establish a link uh, a similarity in composition between what we could see in this original photograph and what we had in the lab. And we've got actually a comparison of that here to show. And these images are also available on our blog today with an update uh, about this. So you can see the clear compositional similarities between this image of the bison here, shown in the photograph of Hornaday's Day's exhibition, with what we have in our lab. This particular tree located just above the hump of the bison and these other two in the skyline are very specific and, and quite uh, recognizable between the two as a point of comparison. In addition, this very uh, pathos filled composition of the bison head is also remarkably similar and it does help that this one is on the far end of the images, it's the least distorted by the angle at which the image was originally taken. So um, with these points of comparison, we were able to pretty uh, confidently ascertain or, or declare that these images were originally created for Mr. Hornaday's exhibition at the 1888 Cincinnati Centennial Ex Exposition. And now these have a, a conceptual home amongst our collections. They are clearly related to Mr. Hornaday. We don't know, again, who the original artist was, but we do know that thanks to his enduring passion for the American bison, these were an important part of his efforts to save them from extinction. So uh, 
We'll now take questions from people tuning in on Facebook. Please comment to, uh, to share with us any thoughts or queries that you might have about the process uh, or about how we came to make this uh, connection. Sure. Well, it's a sad truth that uh, over time, history gets lost. We can see that not just in museum or other cultural heritage collections, but with anything, even family history. People who immigrated to our country from other uh, continents often lost touch with friends and relatives, and so those connections were lost. In a similar way, when these came back, presumably from the exposition, uh, they weren't deemed to be as important, perhaps, as some of the other elements of Mr. Hornaday's exhibition. These were uh, found um, not cataloged or housed in any particular uh, method because th that connection had been lost. We don't know exactly why uh, they were not deemed to be as important as other components or how they ended up exactly where they did, but it does happen relatively frequently. And you can see the same sort of thing in your own home collections where things get uh, piled underneath uh, other things, incoming mail, Etc. And uh, it's just one of the uh, realities of human life and accumulation of of, uh, of items. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Erin. What's your favorite thing about this project? <sighs> That's a good question. Uh, one of my favorite things about this was that it was an opportunity to flex some skills that I didn't necessarily get to use on a regular basis. The majority of our collections are paper based. But this is not only a photographic image on paper, there is an artistic media on top, these, uh, these crayons that were used to soften the image. Uh, it was also an unusual object to house. And then, of course, the finding that link, that spark of recognition when I saw it in a different format, in a different, in a different capture method, if you will, a photograph of these photographic images. Uh, the, the sort of eureka strike of that, I think, was possibly my favorite thing about this project. Absolutely, yes. Um, so how did the material used to create the drawing affect how you approach the treatment? That's an excellent question. So there are three sort of layers, if you will, to this object. There is the linen backing that is underneath the paper. There's the paper that was sensitized at some in, in some way to take a photographic image. And then there's the crayon media on top. And all of these present different difficulties. The linen backing is likely to uh, become separated, like a sweater or other shirt might fray if it gets cut or damaged in some way. The paper is, becomes brittle over time. Uh, in this case, specifically because it was in contact with wood, and wood has acidic compounds in it that can migrate into the paper and cause it to break down. And then the medium on top, the crayon, could be very friable or fragile, uh, meaning that if it's rubbed or abraded in any way, it could lift away. In this case, for whatever reason, the medium is very, very stable, so we were very fortunate. And you can actually see this line here of water damage didn't move any of the pigment in the medium at all, for whatever reason. It appears, because the image isn't distorted at all, it appears that this uh, dark line that you can see is actually all just ma uh, uh, material in the paper that was being pushed by the movement of water, as opposed to the medium being disturbed. So a treatment like this could take uh, any amount of hours or time, depending on the specific needs of an object. But this was several hours worth of work. Uh, first to carefully remove it from the wooden frame, to ensure that any broken parts were carefully cataloged and held onto so that we could relocate them when the treatment was completed. Um, we had to devise and come up with a suitable method for repair and mounting of the image, uh, and then create a custom housing that will protect it in, uh, in the future. So all of these things take a lot of time and consideration, and a lot of time is actually spent conceptualizing what we will do and carefully documenting all of it for the future as well. Um, but it, it can vary widely based on the condition and what we ultimately determine the object needs. That's a good question. A lot of people ask me about that. Uh, frequently, people think that conservation has more to do with natural conservation as opposed to the heritage items that I work with. 
I uh, started out as a volunteer at the Library of Congress, and I worked there for a year before going and getting my master's uh, at a small college called West Dean in England, where I was able to work uh, full-time on uh, library and archival materials from local institutions. And it was wonderful hands-on training that then uh, provided me with opportunities to move into the professional world, uh, working at the Smithsonian Libraries first before coming here to the archives. Well, thanks very much for tuning in. We appreciate the questions and interaction that we've had with you, our social media followers, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care. <laughs>